welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us this afternoon uh, for the School of Education and Human Sciences Summer Conference hosted by our Global Education Academy. This is the third session in a series that we've uh, uh, hosted this summer. The first one was on re-engaging and re-entry in the fall in online education. The second one was on health, wellness, and self-care. And today we're going to talk about the future of education. We have two distinguished panels we'll be introducing to you to, uh, to, to talk with you and uh, share information, hopefully get some questions back from all of you. There are uh, were pre-videos for this session and the other sessions. All will be online, including uh, the recording of this session. Our pre-videos included a presentation by our Commissioner of Education, uh, Randy Watson, talked about the efforts underway in Kansas uh, towards looking towards the future. And then a discussion between uh, Neil Kingston, a distinguished professor of educational psychology here at KU, and Valerie Shute, a distinguished professor of educational psychology at Florida State University, talking about the future of assessment. Um, uh, a little, uh, um, a little uh, homework before we get started. Uh, we do want you to be asking questions of the panelists. Please make sure when you ask your questions, you do it in the Q&A. A um, little bar at the bottom of your Zoom uh, uh, picture. Uh, the chat should be used for sharing information amongst yourselves or any uh, uh, any URLs or things like that you might want to share with the whole group. But the Q and A is where we're going to pull the questions from for our distinguished panelists. Uh, the first panel is going to be uh, focus on the future of teaching and uh, issues of racism uh, in the future and how that will affect teaching in schools. Um, our panelists include uh, Donald Easton Brooks. Donald is the, currently the Dean of the School of Education, College of Education at the University of Nevada, Reno. He is the author of an award-winning book that just came out uh, this year. Um, it's called, um, if I can find the piece of paper, I'll give you the title. Um, it's, um, and I don't have the title in front of me here, so excuse me for that on a minute. In a minute, I'll get that to you. Uh, Ethnic Matching Academic Success of Students of Color. Donald has uh, produced a number of other books and also won an award for a recent study that, uh, that he put out on the use of social media by leaders. Uh, Barnett Berry is our other speaker. Barnett is the, uh, the founding president uh, and former president of the, uh, of the Center for Teacher Quality in North Carolina. Currently is a distinguished research professor at the University of South Carolina. His book, Teacherpreneurs, a number of years ago, uh, really launched a whole discussion about teacher leadership in schools all over the United States. Um, I want to begin this by saying that I think that there are reasons for us to be optimistic about uh, the future of education and how things might change, and at the same time, some reasons for skepticism. Um, uh, beginning in the early part of March, uh, our life in both K-12 and higher education changed rather dramatically with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, as you all know, any of you involved in schools, uh, everything changed. And frankly, none of us know for certain what it's gonna be like in the fall. One thing is true though, we are all online in ways we were never online before, whether it be hybrid or high flex or however you might uh, frame it. So in, in, in those terms, there's some uh, reasons for optimism. And with the murder of George Floyd, and all the discussion about uh, anti-blackness and racism in our country, it appears that there is a moment that we have right now that maybe we can make some adjustments to our culture and to schools, some of the underlying structures, underlying structures and institutionalized racism uh, that we can uh, affect the kinds of changes we've been working on for uh, frankly many hundreds of years. Uh, all that said, uh, the history of education is replete with attempts at change and no change happening. I'm reminded as a, as a heart patient uh, uh, myself that uh, people who go through bypass surgery are asked after their surgery to take uh, two different medicines. And uh, slightly less than half of the people take those two different medicines. One's an aspirin and one's a statin drug. And if you, if you add uh, their, their request to increase their uh, um, uh, exercise and, and uh, change their eating habits, you find that it's a very small percentage of people who've been on a gurney and have their chest cut open that actually change anything after they get out of surgery. So the, the power to stay the same, and if you just look at how many people nowadays just wanna get back to quote unquote normal, why is it that so many people aren't wearing masks and are going to bars and all that? 
They want their lives back. We all do. So will we change? Those are the questions that we're going to pose uh, to you today in our discussions. We're going to begin, begin with two polls uh, for you to get your sense about that. Uh, what do you think? Uh, Sherry, if you would put up the first post poll for us, please. And if you please just go ahead and uh, tell us which of these you expect uh, to happen. Given the widespread use of online and hybrid teaching as a result of the pandemic, when schools are able to fully return in person, how do you think teaching will be changed from the past? And we're getting our numbers up here. And you can see we seem to be dominated by uh, about uh, two thirds to three quarters of you thinking there'll be some change, but there is this press to get back to where we were in the past by uh, an awful lot of uh, uh, those of you who are out there. Sherry, if we could uh, move on to the second question, possibly. And we're just waiting for the second one to come up. So this question, again, is after the murder of George Floyd in Minnesota, uh, all of this press to focus on uh, racism. Education has historically struggled in meeting the needs of students of color and other poorly served populations. Do you think effective uh, effectively addressing the opportunity gaps that exist in schools will change in the future. And here again, it looks to me as if uh, we have, uh, uh, we're kind of in the middle here. We have some, some sense of optimism that things will change, understanding that we are, uh, we are approaching, uh, we are dealing with some very, very complex issues uh, uh, to try to address. And with that, I'm going to ask us to uh, take the poll down. And Barnett, I'm going to turn to you to give us a, about eight to 10 minutes talk about your sense about teaching in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Rick. And it's great to be back with all my friends and colleagues uh, in Kansas uh, and at KU. Um, three quick things, Rick. Um, everyone needs to know, I'm no soothsayer. That's number one. Two, uh, education institutions, uh, like our religious ones, are very slow to change and have been historically. And three, um, the teaching profession has long struggled to become the profession that both teachers and students deserve, the full-fledged profession. And in many ways, teaching today in 2020 uh, does indeed look um, more like it did in the past than perhaps uh, as it should in the future. One thing is certain though, as you mentioned, Rick, um, uh, remote learning has been a challenge and in some ways uh, the, the jury is uh, out and it's been pretty much a, a nightmare all across, not just the country, but across the globe, uh, even in countries that were more ready for this. Um, and the pandemic has been a disruptive force. But here's what we also know, when change does come, um, it comes very fast now. And so I see uh, at least five prospects for the future that can totally transform teaching and uh, reinvent public education as a public good. So I'm a glass half full, maybe even three quarters full sort of guy. Okay, here's number one. Uh, and this is no question, already there's a lot of activity to think about teaching and learning um, and kids as whole children. There's gonna be less uh, emphasis on standardized testing and much more focus on social emotional learning. Also, there's gonna be more opportunities for teachers to engage in new forms of assessment and take some leadership around how kids are assessed, and how even schools are judged. There's going to be more opportunities and a press for more teachers to work in teams um, and more opportunities for teachers to engage with kids in project-based learning as student engagement has become uh, even more the North Star as kids have struggled and teachers have struggled in this remote learning. 
And then finally, as, as we think about uh, young people as, and teaching them as, whole, as the whole child, uh, I think there's going to be a, a push back, which could be a good thing, to more vocational education skills and training, and not just a one-size-fits-all, everybody's supposed to go to college. Uh, that has been the press of many school reforms of the past. So that's one big bucket. Second bucket is that there's going to be more and less technology. Uh, there is some estimate by the year 2025 that 350 billion new dollars will be um, in the, invested in the online education market. And AI, artificial intelligence, will become more uh, accessible for our schools to use in, in a variety of ways. But what I do see as a possibility is that teachers driving the AI and not AI driving teachers and driving their work. I'll also see uh, parents, uh, particularly in the midst of this pandemic, valuing uh, their schools and their teachers. And particularly they're seeing schools as more than just a place where kids learn the three R's, but as hubs of a community, as safe and nurturing places for kids to go to every day uh, for that safety and nurturance. Kids miss their friends and parents miss their kids missing their friends them to get back to school. Uh, as a result of this, I see pushback against all the market-based based reforms that have been dominant in the last 20 years in this country, and more emphasis on what's called community schooling. Rick, it's something that I'm deeply involved in back in my home state of South Carolina now. Um, and as a result of this emphasis on community schooling, where integrators are part of uh, of a kid's academic development, i.e. social, emotional, physical, mental health, all as part of, of the whole portfolio of supports for kids inside of a, of a school as a hub of a community, that's going to dramatically change the role of teachers. And I see a, a greater investment in teachers and their leadership because of the complexities that all schools and all communities uh, are facing right now. Imagine, uh, as we get out of this routine of the every day, the same schedule, flex schedule, hybrid roles, whatever, imagine kids are in, uh, teachers um, have at least one full day a week for professional learning. And the other four days, they're um, uh, more engaged uh, in teaching kids. Uh, we see that this concept of teacherpreneurs, where more teachers are teaching part of the day, but then and having their time invested in a variety of leadership activities, both inside their schools, but also across their districts and across their states and even across their nation. The need for teachers to work with each other using technology, uh, garnering each other's expertise is has been pronounced during the time of this pandemic and teachers are beginning to take advantage of it. Now, will their superintendents and their policy leaders do so as well? That's another story. And then finally, um, let me say that I see this upheaval in higher education, uh, shifting its focus and pressing a greater alignment with K-12 or PK-12. And so um, in not too distant future, cross-sector partnerships are to create more roles for teachers to work more closely together, perhaps even in joint appointments uh, as we develop this more um, seamless approach from birth uh, to career. I am hopeful for at least a couple of reasons. Uh, one, there's no question, um, American individualism is still present and will be with us. It's part of our culture. I don't see it uh, totally going away, but I do see a renewed faith in our public institutions and um, public goods. I, I'm hearing and reading of thought leaders who have pushed against public education, who've pushed for marketplace reforms, have totally turned uh, 180 degrees and now are promoting uh, government as a good thing, not a bad thing. And, and I'm also seeing more parents saying that teaching is so darn hard and I value teachers more than ever before. And I see that being related into some political currency that uh, I'm hoping the teaching profession will capitalize on and take the uh, 
the reins of their profession finally, uh, after many decades of teachers being the targets of reform as opposed to be the leaders of reform. And then finally, as I turn it over to Donald, uh, Rick, um, I do think this horrific um, murder of Mr. Floyd, which is not, unfortunately, um, not an anomaly in our society, but this particular murder seemed to press on uh, not just a focus on injustices in, in policing, but now I'm hearing the same leadership about injustice in policing and injustices in our education and our healthcare system and our economic system. And that gives me great hope uh, that we are going to take advantage of this crisis and finally create the profession of teaching and public education that all children deserve. And Rick, that was eight minutes. Well, that was the first, ladies and gentlemen. Barnett stuck to his time. We appreciated that. Donald, let's turn it over to you to talk about it. Uh, uh, looking towards the future, focusing on the issues of uh, racism and, 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 and working with uh, our students of color. Yeah, thanks, Rick, and very good, Barnett. Um, you know, and I, and I, I really want to kind of pull off, pull, start off where uh, Barnett left off, and it's really about um, looking at what this death has meant to, to the community as a whole. But when you think about uh, Black communities and communities of color, it really is a matter of now that people have, have started to take a different focus, it's an opportunity to think about not just how do we engage in communities of color, but also how do we engage with white communities who understand that what has been happening over generations is not something that's new, but that we need allies who are able to step in and say, okay, how do I battle these, these systems of injustice? When we think about education and think about this educational system and as, as people of color have constantly talked about these challenges, both in society, in education, et cetera, um, the conversation has seemed to be lost or not understood. A lot of this comes from perception. We all comes in, come into a situation with the lens, with the frame of reference. And oftentimes it's hard to see the other person's frame of reference because we're trying to gear what people are saying to us based on what our experiences tell us. If our experiences tell us that this is not a reality or it's hard to understand that reality, we tend to push the other person's reality away. When I spend time in the Midwest and especially in South Dakota, a lot of the, the native communities would talk about the notion of multicultural education, a cultural responsiveness. And they would talk about it in the sense that we cannot start that conversation until we're able to recognize the challenges that communities are facing, until we're able to recognize the pain that happens within communities. And so we try to recognize what's going on within communities. Can we start change to happen? We hear a lot of this when we talk about people who might go through um, AA or go through some type of addiction, getting over it. The first thing you have to do is recognize that there is a problem. And I think in our society, we have not necessarily, excuse me, have not necessarily recognized that we have a systematic problem. We thought about there's a problem that's happening with a group of people. And oftentimes we've said it's that group of people that need to change their change the strategies of what's going on in their lives rather than looking at how their barriers that are impacting this. The question that was brought up in the poll really centered around the opportunities and opportunity gaps. And I think that's where a lot of the perception and understanding is really kind of um, fallen off center. Oftentimes we want to talk about the academic gap, I mean, achievement gap, which is a challenging thing to get to because we need to first determine what's, what achievement is about. But when we start to think about the opportunity gaps, I think that's where we can really get into thinking about education and that perception of what's happening in education. For instance, as we think about the pandemic, the, um, the, the COVID pandemic, and as we think about it and think about what's happening with students, what we're finding is that communities of color are having a harder time connecting with schools, whether it's public school, I mean, whether it's uh, PK-12 or whether it's higher education. Now, oftentimes it has to do with access to internet, access to um, 
um, to engage in online or remote learning. And we're finding that a lot of our more challenging communities don't have the internet access that our more affluent communities have. We're having companies that are starting to step up to say, okay, how do we provide more access to the internet for our communities? Some of our, our communities, we don't have a number of computers at home or have the access to computers to be able to do the work at home. Um, a safe, a quiet place, shouldn't say safe, but a quiet place in order to study and to do things. So a lot of these opportunities that are, that are facing children, we're not, we have to pay attention to. What has happened a lot is that when we think about our own perception, we saying, okay, I can provide for my child a computer. I can provide for my child um, a three, four bedroom home where they have their own privacy, et cetera. You might not find that in more communities of poverty or even in more communities where poverty that is associated to race is happening. And so we have to step back and think about how those opportunities are lost and how the opportunity to learn, uh, how this, how this, sorry, how this, this challenge right now can really impact and, and increase the opportunity or achievement gap for students of color because they don't have that same opportunity or access to what's going on in schools as they do now. What I really think that is happening is what we've really talked about a lot in education around what's happening with, with uh, Floyd and what's happening with the opportunity is that whole notion of, as I mentioned before, the recognition. And how do we get our community to recognize those challenges that people are facing? How do we get people to understand the, the, the challenges that are facing, not just from a physicalness and violence of, of police officers, but these systematic systems that are really holding students back and causing them not to be able to learn? Now, a lot of my research I've done, I'm really trying to figure out how do we engage in culture responsive systems that really moves children to learn? One of the things that I've found is that I've asked over 450 teachers, both of color and not, do you use culture responsive practice in your teaching? And this is uh, pre-Floyd um, and pre-pandemic, et cetera. Do you use culture responsive teaching in your practice? And white teachers said that they, I'm sorry, let me back up. All the teachers said at a rate of about 96 to 98% that they've taken a class in cultural responsive practice or multicultural education or something. But when you ask these teachers if you use it in your practice, what happened is that white teachers at a rate of about 70% said they use it in their practice compared to teachers of color, whether they're or Black or Latinx, et cetera, was a rate of anywhere from 94 to 96% said they use it in their practice. Then when asked, why do you not use it? White teachers predominantly said, because I don't know how to do it. Now, when you get to the point of thinking about you're taking a class, yet you don't know how to use it, it brings up another serious problem. Are we really teaching the class at an intent that we want teachers to learn this, to say, okay, this is something we're teaching at an intent. And what I find is that as we look at higher education, as we do this work, and we look at school districts as we do this work, we're not attending to this in the same way that we're attending to this related to technology, attending this in the same way we look at content areas like math or science, or even reading. We see this as something that's so complex and difficult as we see in the question about it being a difficult uh, issue that we tend to blow it off because we think about it as being too complex. Well, if we're going to successfully educate and work with students, we need to think about that. Our public schools are becoming more and more diverse and more and more students of color. In a place like Houston, Texas, where you see that um, our fourth largest city in the country, 8%, that's my timer, but I get some of Barnett's time, I guess, 8% of the, of the Houston Public School District is white. 92% is of color. You could probably find something similar to that in Kansas City, et cetera. And so because of this, we have to step back and think about how intentional are we in thinking about how do we reduce these gaps of race? As we look at this, last point with this, as we look at this, we have to step back and stop thinking about how do we teach children of color to deal with racism? And start to think about how do we help white kids understand racism and the impact of racism on our community and our society. 
How do we engage in them in this conversation in a way that we can make this more intentional so we can effectively break down barriers and help effectively help people understand their perception and how their perception can cause barriers to occur? Well, Donald, thank you. Barnett and Donald, do you two want to ask one another any questions or do we want to turn to the audience? There's some terrific questions, Rick. Uh, Don, Donald, thoughts? Let me unmute. Um, yeah, I, you know, as you, you know, as you talk about, you know, again, the technology and those type of things, um, we talk a lot about, or when we think about this, we talk a lot about um, our communities we think about the most, and that's the, our urban communities. How are these things, how do you see these things impact in our rural community and education in our rural communities? Well, I think the, the silver lining of this pandemic has made, has made what has been known to many education insiders, teachers in particular, administrators inside of schools, knowing exactly where the problems are, but what they have known is now more known by others. I think the in South Carolina, for example, there is now a rush to bring internet access to the 38% of the families of children in the state of South Carolina who do not have internet access. There is investments from the private sector and from the banking industry uh, to uh, create opportunities for kids to learn in ways that they never even thought about it before. So I do see um, this pandemic opening people's eyes and uh, to the gross disparities that have been in play for a long time, Donald, uh, including in our rural communities where actually across the country, one in five children uh, live. Let me, uh, thank you, Barnett. Thanks, Donald. Uh, here's a, I'm gonna ask some questions from the audience. Uh, uh, this is from uh, Jason in the audience and I'm not gonna give you the uh, intro, but I, and he directed this, Barnett, while you were, talking, but I think it, it, it fits for both of you. So you might want to take a stab at it. And the question is, how do we maximize the positive feelings that you're suggesting we capitalize on to emphasize the need for positive change moving forward instead of backsliding to appease those who just want to, quote, get back to normal for convenience sake? Well, I think um, our school systems, both at the local and state level, need to do a much better job at engaging uh, the public and parents in particular around the prospects and possibilities. Um, most school systems will have a communications director that does mostly damage control and public relations. We need to have full-fledged public engagement campaigns. And public engagement does not mean just telling folks what you want them to hear. It means literally engaging, listening, uh, conversing, educating, uh, just like we'd like to do in our classrooms. We need to do more of that with our public, Rick. And I think we've got to invest money and time and people into that strategy uh, to kind of build off this momentum. Because if not, uh, backsliding is probably uh, going to happen. And I would say, I would say as it relates to, am I on mute? Am I not? Am I, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. A button threw me off. It says mute, so I didn't know if that would mean I'm on mute. But anyway, I'm I'm good now. I'm 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 anti-boomer now. Um, so here's a here's a challenge with this as well. You know, as we think about this whole notion of how do we engage and how do we recognize and how do we understand from a race perspective or dealing with race, the biggest challenge that we have is that our our educational system is not diverse enough. And we have to find ways to diversify our educational system. Um, in my research, it shows that kids who interact with at least one um, teacher of their, of their race uh, or teacher of color throughout their elementary school tend to do significantly better in education than not. A lot of that has to do with even the interactions between teachers and it's not just student to teacher. But I look at it in, in this way. How can we recognize or engage with other races or other people if we don't have that interaction? It would be like, if I'm having a problem with my wife because of our interaction and communication, but I keep going to males and saying to males, I'm having this problem and I'm getting advice, advice from males on how to interact with my wife, who's a female. 
And what I'm doing is just getting this information that makes sense to me from that kind of male perspective, rather than opening up my mind and saying, why don't I talk to people, females, who might have a different perspective of, of, that could help me understand more of why my wife might be thinking the way that she's thinking about my interactions with her. And in that same way with the race, if we diversify our field and we're able to have these critical conversations with each other, it can help teachers understand how do I interact and how do I engage with students of different races as we move along, especially now. One of the things that's gonna be very challenging is that this emotional, this emotionalness that people of color are feeling right now about what's happening. And if I am a white teacher or a teacher who will not engage with communities of color, if I don't figure out how to interact or work with these students, I am going to miss an opportunity. And the best way to do that is by thinking about how do I diversify um, our workforce so that we can have these critical conversations. And in the words of Barry, how do we have these kind of town halls or, or meetings that really help us understand how do we listen to one another and how do we engage so that we can really help these young ones understand how to um, engage in a, in, a, in a work environment, school environment, sorry. Uh, I'm going to uh, jump in. We got some great questions uh, from the group. Maybe I'll, I'll go at one of theirs, then I have one. Uh, a bunch of people have asked, uh, have, have acknowledged that uh, that they need help with this. Donald, as you suggested, uh, 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 Danielle said, what advice do you have moving forward? A couple of people asked for any insights that you might have on uh, 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 sources or places we could they could learn more about culturally responsive teaching. Uh, one questioner asked, said that, I'm a first grader. How do I have these conversations with Absolutely. children at that age level? So what, what, what advice might you have, Donald and Barnett? Sure. You might jump in on that as well. You know, I think the thing is, is that kids, especially young kids, they, they are very perceptive. And, and I think what happens is that you have to do what we do as teachers. You have to, to inquire and you have to find out from kids the perspective and the angle in which they're coming in with. For instance, an example of this, I grew up in, in Houston and doing Thanksgiving, it was always the same thing. You know, thinking about turkey, thinking about, you know, you draw the turkey hand and et cetera, et cetera. Well, my family's Louisiana Creole. And so for me, it wasn't a cultural, a good cultural experience for me because we didn't eat turkey. We ate gumbo, etouffee, jambalaya, things that really related to being Creole. And we didn't, that was the feast and celebration in my house. Now, while as a kid, it didn't really warp my education, but when those experiences happened, I didn't feel connected because it wasn't about me. I did the exercise, I behaved, but I didn't feel connected to that. So the best way to address that is by having kids say, so during this time, what are the foods your families eat? What is it that, that your family do during this time? To really get in a sense of what's going on with them, before you give a lesson, maybe talk to the kids about their experiences with these moments and find out what was going on. One of my biggest experiences was when I was working on my master's degree in Colorado, and I did a uh, thesis rather than taking the test. Imagine that. And um, I asked kids to build a bridge. I was, the cultural lens was wrong. There are no bridges in Denver. There are overpass, but there are no bridges because there's no water for bridges to go over. So from a cultural framework, you would think that kids, even in third grade, would understand the notion of a bridge, but they didn't. And so I had to step back and think about what is it I was trying to do and what information I need from a cultural lens to help them understand this. And the best way to do this is by inquiring, asking what is this and getting a cultural framework for what this is about. That's the best way to do it. Again, it gets to perception. When we put our perception in play, we oftentimes are culturally biased. One more example of this, when I worked as a social worker before I got into teaching, I had a parent come to me and she said, she moved to Denver and she said, um, I just moved to Denver from LA. I don't have a place to live. I don't have transportation. I don't have a job, et cetera. And in my perception, and she had a child, in my perception, I couldn't figure out what she needed. So I assume, all right, you need bus tokens so you can get back and forth and that's what you needed. But in my whateverness, naiveness, I asked her, what is it that you need? And she said, I need diapers. Not being a parent, I had no clue the value of that. And from a cultural lens, I had no clue the value of that. 
But after being a parent, I understood the value of that. If the child is uncomfortable, you're going to be uncomfortable. And so we have to really step back and not be afraid to ask questions and ask questions that help us understand where our students are coming from. So we're able to look at the curriculum from a framework that really is connecting with students rather than what our perception tells us what we should be doing. Yeah, uh, we have a, a, a question here that is uh, um, a bit about the School of Education here, but it, I, I think it, um, um, but I think uh, speaks to some of the issues we have in, in, in many of our schools around the country. Uh, this is a person who had gone through her doctoral, her his doctoral program uh, at KU and, uh, and noticed that uh, in the teacher prep program and frankly in our doctoral programs, most of the students were white. Um, and the question is, uh, how can uh, schools and colleges of education encourage uh, people of color to embrace the teaching profession? How can we as a profession Right. encourage people to embrace this? What kinds of incentives need to be offered? Uh, the question is, how can we reflect, uh, how can we do, let's reflect in, in, in a useful way. This is, a, I think, a fair criticism of the School of Education, and the same criticism can be leveled at a, a, a wide variety of school districts all over the United yeah. States as well. Uh, okay, address this real quick, Barry, and then I can hand it over to you. But one of the things we have to think about that's a challenge to us is that First of all, we have almost every other field that are trying to diversify as well. And so with them trying to diversify, we are competing against the health industry uh, with businesses, et cetera. Um, when we think about the College of Education, there are things we have to, our education as a whole, there are, are narratives that we have to destroy. People talk about how difficult it is to be a teacher, but we don't talk about the rewards of being a teacher. People have painted a narrative about education that makes it challenging for us to want to go into education. We also have barriers as it relates to our entrance exams. We know that there's no correlation between the basic um, skills tests we ask students to take and their ability to pass their comprehensive exam or their, their licensure at the end, yet we still ask students to take this. If we don't look at saying, okay, have they taken EP classes? Have they been admitted into college? How does a grade point average look in their content area as some of those kind of prereqs for saying they have the basic skills? So saying we're gonna have them take another test that might cost them $300 if the test is $100 because of having to take it three times and not thinking about that barrier and all the test anxiety, et cetera, that goes along with that, that we know is race driven so we have to kind of reduce those kind of barriers that causes that to happen. We have to change the narrative about what education is about and what it means and what goes on within education. That's one of the biggest things I fight is really trying to, as I really try to get people involved in education as well. As we think about this and look at this, we also have to think about the experiences that people of color are having in education. So why would you want to go into a field that you feel like didn't respond to you and now you're going to go in and, and try to make a difference. So we have to change that narrative. We have to help people understand the value of diversifying education. Some of the things that I've worked with different states like South Dakota, Oregon, um, Colorado, et cetera, on, is really looking at pathway programs. And in those pathway programs, really thinking about how do you get students to think about education while they're in high school and the impact of, of tutoring, the impact of helping students understand one con uh, help the students understand how to do a content like reading or math and helping them, these students understand their impact on students as they go through this. And I've been able to work with states in which we've gotten a, about 400 students to this point to go into education because of their initial thoughts about that, changing the paradigm of what education is about. Barnett, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, two quick ways to think about this. Um, one is we need to triple down on the investments in the pathways to diversifying uh, the teaching profession in ways that we've done in the past. Uh, for the last 30 years, there have been powerful programs, pre-collegiate programs, uh, to intentionally uh, encourage and begin supporting uh, young people of color to become teachers. We've had terrific programs that took paraprofessionals who were in our schools who are people of color and make it easy and supportive of them to become fully credentialed teachers. We have residency programs today that have done a terrific job, uh, but with just 
modest means to bring uh, more diverse teachers into the profession. Uh, the Learning Policy Institute, just a policy document, um, ladies and gentlemen, that we ought to look at outline these really powerful programs. We need to double down that investment. But we also, I think, need to think differently about uh, young people's access to adults that care and can mentor them. Think about a youth development strategy uh, in your school system that goes beyond just the credential teacher, but to people in the community who can serve as mentors, formal and informal, to provide the same kind of support that all these young people really deserve. Um, so we got to think very differently about the, the pool of people that we can draw upon and double down on the investments that we have, that research has shown have worked in getting more diverse uh, teachers into the profession. And I've got one last question, then we're going to uh, close out this session and move on to our next one, but I'm going to ask Barnett and uh, Donald to stay with us so at the end we can, we can have questions amongst all four of our presenters. Um, uh, Here's a, a, a situation that I find in higher education, and I know in currently working with principals and superintendents and teachers around the country, it's the same thing, is many times when we offer training in these things, it's almost like a fundamentalist tent that the same people who believe in it always show up. Right. They're the ones that are there for it, and it's the people that you really need in the tent who don't show up. Right. Or if they're there, they don't attend to the issues that need to be attended to. So the question is, how do we engage all and not just a few? We have to engage the few because as many of our, our, our teachers here and educators here pointed out, we all need help in many of the facets of what we're talking about around teaching and around issues around race. But how do we engage everybody in this right. important work? It's not gonna work unless we have everybody in the tent uh, working together. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's what I found in the research and in my research thinking about uh, the impacts of teachers of color and, in, and looking at teachers of color and looking at um, the whole notion of cultural responsiveness in relationship to teachers of color and with white teachers. And it's about the intentionality. How intentional do you think this work is? A lot of that intentionality is also going to have to come from what is the uh, school district or the, 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 the state, et cetera. How intentional are they in putting policies together to say that there are some benchmarks that are that need to happen to show that you are able to reach all students. You have places like um, Washington State or Seattle that do a lot of this good work and saying these policies are important and relevant and they push these policies and they're part of, of assessments of teachers. But it's up to our districts to make this intentional, to put policies in place to say that this is a requirement. This is not an add-on. Um, so while we have math and science as a content and we say that if you're in those contents you need to do this, we need to look at diversity or equity or cultural responsiveness as a serious content. And if you're not able to do this, then you need training on it um, and focus on what the students are getting out of this, et cetera. So I think that's important. Thank you, Donald. Barnett, the last word. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we um, Educators need to be driving a Tesla right now, and we have them in a Pinto. If we don't rethink the entire education operation, the school calendar, the school the roles of teachers and other educators in and outside the K-12 spectrum. If we don't really begin to dramatically shift all of that, Rick and Donald, we're not going to be able to solve these complex problems. We cannot solve our problems and get to where we need to go. We need to Well, I wish I was Oprah Winfrey and I could uh, tell the whole audience that I've got Teslas waiting for them outside, yeah, yeah. Uh, but we don't. Uh, I want to thank Donald and Barnett. And if you guys would meet yourselves and Mike, and Jung, if you would come in and join us, we're gonna move on to the second part of uh, our conversation. Uh, and uh, to our audience, let me introduce to you uh, uh, Michael Waymeyer and uh, Young Zhao, uh, a little bit about them. They uh, are both rather distinguished fellows. Uh, both are distinguished professors in the School of Education at KU. Uh, Mike is the uh, Marion Beach uh, Distinguished Professor. Uh, and the chairman of our Department of Special Education, uh, probably the world's uh, uh, leading scholar and advocate on the area of self-determination. Uh, Yong Zhao is uh, also a foundation distinguished professor at the University of Kansas. Uh, Young has uh, distinguished himself in uh, his writings in a number of areas uh, uh, early on uh, about testing, um, about creativity and entrepreneurship, 
uh, and most recently a lot on, on personalized learning. Together, these two uh, uh, professors have re recently written a book called Teaching Students to Become Self-Determined Learners. Teaching Students to Become Self-Determined Learners. And uh, uh, they're going to talk today a little bit about self-determined learning, which emphasizes student autonomy and choice, and turning over the ownership for learning to students by supporting them and creating activities that are engaging and of personal value to them and so that they will act more volitionally. Uh, so we've got two great scholars. They're going to uh, have a conversation amongst themselves, and then we're going to open it up for, converse, for some discussion. And I will ask at the end that uh, Donald and Barnett join us as well, and we can uh, have some more Q&A with the audience. So I don't know who's up first, Mike or uh, Jung? Mike. Michael. Mike first. All right. Well, greetings, everyone. Uh, thanks, Rick, and uh, thanks to Doctors Easton Brooks and uh, Barry for uh, a thoughtful and, and thought-provoking first session. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen very quickly. Um, the uh, uh, as as Rick mentioned, uh, Young and I um, uh, recently published a book with uh, ASCD. Uh, and Mike, the screen, by the way, is black. The screen is oh, black. Good. No, we got it. Okay, thank you. We yeah, there it. we go. Um, uh, called teaching students to become self-determined learners. Um, you know, we we uh, had this written and in production well before the pandemic, but uh, it's clear that um, uh, these issues of the importance of student-directed uh, <laughs> learning. Um, have been uh, highlighted by the pandemic. So now I'm going to try and stop sharing my screen. And I'm not being very successful on that. There it is. Stop share, stop share. Sorry. I'm frozen. Well, Mike, why don't you go ahead and just talk? That'll be fine. Yeah, I'll go ahead. I'm All right. Uh, well, Mike um, does this since we work on the book together. So I, I think the, the basic message as um, given the pandemic, you know, that if I were to write a book right now, I would be emphasis on self-determination. I think for a long time, uh, our schools have really uh, not been paying too much attention to that angle. So I'm hoping that all schools and teachers will begin to think about how students can become their own managers of their own learning. That goes with really several big things in schools, especially today, if children were not able to come to school, if they had to stay home for a long time, what would we like to do? I would like to say, number one, every student develop a personalized curriculum, a personalized curriculum, you know, that, which is, uh, uh, that means that they can negotiate with the curriculum, the state curriculum, with the school leaders, with parents, with teachers, partially how they want to learn, what they want to learn, but also they should be able to add something they are interested in. You know, I think right now the school curriculum dominate everything. So they should have autonomy over what they want to learn, what they can learn, and how they want to be learned. I think this is the best time to renegotiate that, to cope with students' interest in advocating learning for themselves, in managing learning for themselves. And I was uh, looking at uh, a, a report actually uh, yesterday that is, uh, uh, I cannot share now until Mike uh, get off this, but anyway, when Mike gets, struggles with that, it gets off, we'll do that. The second point I would like to say is that uh, we would not be able to teach students in a traditional way. I saw, uh, I, I was actually quite surprised that uh, during the poll that Rick started, about a 68% of uh, all the audience said about, uh, well, there will be some changes. And not a lot, but some changes. What would the some changes be? I think, first of all, one big change, hopefully that can happen, 
is we do not repeat our online teaching anymore. We do not treat students when they're home that we can teach them. What I'm hoping to change is to renegotiate with every student how they want learning to happen to take place. That is going to be very important. That is, can students determine when they want to learn and how they want to learn? Remember, the first part is that what they want to learn. I would like to see schools now, actually, when students do not come to school, technically, they have longer learning time. When they come to school, we legitimize, we define the learning time to be the time in school. Now they're not here. That's much longer. But that means requires us to redesign our learning to be how do we make sure our children are learning all the time at their preference. And the third part, I'm going to finish this and then pass back to Mike, is that uh, we traditionally teach students within a large group. A group of 25, 35, depending on the school you're in. Can we re-divide that? Can we organize students into a group of one, group of three, groups of 10, groups of 100? Depending on the activity, depending on the work. How do students organize smaller communities? Recently, I've been seeing a lot of students being able to organize their learning through self-determination and find the resource they can learn from online, from other places. There's mass, we call that massive learning environments like fan fiction writing, like Scratch, like Minecraft. There are many different ways of, of doing that. So henceforth, that means our teachers, we change our roles. We don't do the direct instruction. We supervise, we support, we facilitate our students' learning. So they can really own their own learning. Before I end, I want to show us um, uh, a screen. And why, I don't know why they just let me talk about why well, I can't. And I think, sorry about that. We are having struggle with this then. The, this new report came out of the National Governors Association. It's called Reimagining Workforce Policy in the Age of Disruption. It talks about the age of disruption which is really allowing us to, to do something quite different. Mike, do you want to continue with that? We're having a conversation here. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, uh, Wi-Fi issues at home. Uh, sorry about that. So uh, I'm sure that whatever you said was brilliant. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the things, you know, I think um, uh, this idea that Mike, you're breaking up a bit. Why don't you go ahead and uh, and just take your picture off the screen? And uh, sometimes you, that helps with your uh, um, helps with the uh, your Wi-Fi connection. Is that better? Can yes. can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, we can. Please go ahead. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, anyway, um, you know, I think the key is that we do know how to support students to be more uh, autonomous, and and this isn't just uh, abandoning students to uh, to be left alone and to drift without structure or without uh, support. You know, we we turn over uh, ownership uh, for learning by. First of all, uh, you know, supporting students to engage in, in activities that are of personal value to them and are meaningful to them um, and uh, that incorporate elements of volitional action and choice. We provide lots of opportunities for uh, 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 students to choose and, and have their choices influence uh, the curriculum, uh, you know, not just minor things. I, I, I heard uh, Young say that. Um, you know, that uh, uh, we uh, harness the power of student autonomy and ownership by teaching students to teach themselves. We, we do have a strong uh, 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 research and literature base showing that, we, that when young people are provided opportunities to learn how to self-regulate learning, how to, how to, how to self-determine learning, they can do that. 
by uh, focusing on having students' goals uh, drive uh, what happens in classrooms instead of everyone else's goals. Um, obviously creating learning communities that emphasize students' curiosity. Um, a whole host of things uh, that uh, enable young people uh, to take uh, greater ownership over learning. Um, young? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I have a phone coming. This is very strange. But uh, anyway, so uh, this is why we're doing this from home. You know, there are several things I think right now fits quite well with the schools. Number one is the pandemic. We are going to have disruptions. Where, whatever you do in the future, it is going to happen. We won't be able to have students back to school all the time, all the way in the traditional sense. Number two, this fits uh, you know, what schools are pushing for, the social emotional learning. I think a lot of us now are engaged in Kansas is leading this. But I think uh, I, I wrote an article recently about this, is that social emotional learning is deeply connected with academic learning. It's students' life. Uh, I'm not a big believer of running an extra course to help them, but really it's about students take action to own their own learning, to have rights to their life, to think about how they can uh, learn and how they want to interact. The third one that relates very well to our current and really future movement is called personalization. Many schools have been addressing personalization, trying to do that, but a lot of times from right now, I say on the market, the biggest personalization mark, uh, uh, products are mostly computer-driven software. It's really for student learning. That's not really personalization. That's called a programmed learning from the 1950s. You know, it's, uh, that's not, you know, true personalization when it comes from student choice, students exercise autonomy that, you know, can they, uh, are they allowed to take control of their, what they want to learn? And so I'm really thinking about a lot about a negotiated curriculum. A curriculum of students has a lot of voice and choice, but also there's another big point about self-determination, which Mike you know, has done a lot of research with and is, is students owning the learning space. As a collective, they own the school, they own whatever online and offline space you design. So they co-own this with adults. How do you negotiate management? I think right now, a lot of schools uh, um, really require students to do certain things, but is there any negotiation? You know, by the way, right now, the whole country uh, is, is you know, quite, quite, you know, a lot of things is happening. I think one of students to be able to take control and to be practicing democracy, to protect democracy, they need to practice. So self-determination is a right that students as individuals should have. Self-determination helps students to become self, you know, uh, self-independent citizens and individuals in the future. Self-determination, I think Mike has enough evidence that we've shown in a book, supports their learning. They become better learners. They become more effective, efficient learners. Mike? I think Mike has gone away. Rick, you want to invite questions? So Mike, I do. I, I've got a, some questions from the group. Uh, Mike's there too. Mike, maybe you can, you can jump in first on this. Uh, a bunch of questions about uh, self-determination. One, one question was about um, how do you engage students at the lower levels? Uh, this one was about level two, but in, in, in the earliest years, how, are, the, are those students able to uh, do their own determinations about what they should learn? And a related question was, how do we, how do we engage parents uh, in the negotiation about, uh, uh, student, about self-determination? Are they a part of this package or is it just the students here? Mike? Mike's having some, uh, uh, Mike, did you get that? No, I didn't. Uh, my, Mike, my the question was, how do, you engage, how do you engage the youngest students? And uh, are parents a part of the, uh, uh, the process in, in the self-determination model? Yeah, so um, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, in fact, children become self-determined because uh, they grow up in families where uh, families uh, uh, 
uh, incorporate the same, uh, you know, involvement in choice making and problem solving and goal setting and decision making into it. So really, uh, families are the most important element of this. And then, you know, there are lots of, of uh, what we call foundational skills leading to later self determination that can that can become part of uh, elementary education, a focus on engaging students in problem solving, supporting students to set goals, teaching some early uh, self-regulation kinds of things. So there's lots of things that can be done and should be done across the life course. Um, one of the things that before my uh, uh, internet started acting up again, uh, Young said something, you know, as we look into the future, um, one of the things that I keep hearing is that young people today will leave uh, high school and college and they will, they will have, uh, you know, they will have 10 different careers, not just jobs, but the, everything is changing so rapidly, technology is changing. Uh, there's really no way we can uh, uh, give every child all they need to know. And so, you know, 21st century learning advocates talk about the four C's, creativity, um, communication, uh, critical thinking, um, and uh, whatever the other C is. Uh, and, and, you know, I think what is often missed in this is that if students are going to be successful, we have to prepare them to be self-determined learners because they're going to have to continually design their own careers. We used to talk about career development where your career unfolded in front of you if you did step one and step two and step three and that's just not going to be the case. Students are going to have to be active problem solvers. They're going to have to figure out what they do well and, and what they like to do and they're going to have to figure out how that fits into projects that contribute to larger uh, pictures. So, you know, uh, for all uh, young people, um, these, these, these skills around self-determined learning uh, are, are going to be, I think, as important as any other skill in the future, so. Rick, you're muted. Um, Yon, why don't you go ahead and then Barnett, I see you want to jump in. Yon? Oh, well, yeah, I, I was just going to add that uh, um, when Mike was talking about the future, really, um, we are already behind from a lot of research saying that school change, education change is already behind. We are interested in thing called the fourth industrial revolution, posting automation in the 19, I don't know, 1990s, early 21st century. We're way behind. We've been talking about 21st century education since the last time. We're now two, two decades into this new century. We're not moving very fast. So it's a basically we are behind. I, I don't think simply changing the curriculum, forcing teachers to do this or that, and trying to play with the school system is going to work out much. Honestly, we've been trying this for how many decades? And if you look at any of our basic data, it's not showing improvement. I actually think the change partners will have to be students. We have to work with the students, no matter where they are. You know, we're just talking about equity issues, for example. I encourage all of us try to bring more equity, better policy, better system. But at the same time, we have millions of kids every day in situations that you know those policies were not made. They have to rely on themselves. If we can help every young child, whatever background they are coming from our schools, I support family. Family can do a lot, but if we have kids who have horrible situation in families, in communities. They come to school, first grade, kindergarten. We help them to make choices, make good choices, be able to identify resources. They can grow, they can change. I think that we need to work on students as partners of change, students as self-determined learners. Arnett? Yeah, this is the indelible link between our two sessions, Young and Michael. Um, I love you, what you said, students must own their learning space. Well, how in the heck are they going to be able to do that if those who teach them aren't owning their own learning space? And teachers don't have the agency to be teacherpreneur, uh, to uh, 
incubate and execute their own ideas. Um, we got to create a system for teach those who teach kids um, to have their own space to lead. Well, I'm just trying to add, I, I really plead that I think we, everyone knows we have to work from all the systems. We can change the system, change the policy, but for the people in the audience, if we have some teachers there, if you believe in this, do something, give some space, some time to help the students. I hope you will see the student, you will see the child before you see the curriculum, before you see the testing. In the long run, we know, honestly, the curriculum, the testing are not having much in, uh, impact on students as you as a person. Give students space so they can practice. Self-determination, actually students have that. We need to help them. There are skills, there are abilities that can help them become better at that. And I think that's something we can emphasize. We can help them to develop that. Mike, go ahead. Yeah, you know, um, uh, Barnett mentioned uh, teachers and empowering teachers. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, there was a book by Seymour Saracen called The Predictable Failure of School Reform. And the point of that book was that as long as school reform was hierarchical and flowed from the top down, at the bottom were teachers and students. And until we leveled that playing field and the voices of teachers and students had the same power as the voices of people who are, you know, at the higher, you know, levels making decisions, school reform was, was, was going to fail. You know, I think that um, one of the, th the threads of uh, Young's work that has always been very compelling in talking about uh, student uh, agency um, is, is that this work is strengths-based. Um, I've worked in the disability sphere all my life. I'm so tired of talking about what children can't do. I really have no interest in what children can't do. What I'm interested in is what kids do well, what they love to do, and harnessing that so that they learn and it's meaningful to them. You know, these notions of average and testing and all that stuff, I just, you know, and others have said it more eloquently, but, uh, um, you know, uh, I don't think it has any utility. We need to start with what every young person does well. We need to build systems that harness that. We need to, you know, uh, in the book we talk about if you canvas, if you look at all of the international surveys that ask students one word about what they think about school, 80% uh, or more students choose a word that's basically equivalent to bored. They're bored, they're not motivated. I mean, I talk to teachers, you, you talk to teachers, they often say that their biggest problem is that students aren't motivated. Well, are students not motivated or is it what we are doing is not very motivating and we need to, you know, the power of learning when students uh, engage in something that's meaningful to them, that's based on something they do well and that they have an interest in uh, can really blossom. I think Mike, I just want to add that uh, several things. One, I, I was re reviewing the Q&As. There are some questions about testing. You mentioned that. I hope testing will not return as they were. I, I'm hoping that. I think uh, testing has done America a lot of, lot of bad. It has not helped Americans improve. Okay, so that, that's the standardized testing. It's not helping. The second thing I think Mike was really emphasizing is, is student really confidence. It's all motivation. You were talking about how do we motivate students? Technically, learning should not be motivated. Children are very interested in learning. It's just whether we acknowledge that. So there was a question to say, okay, what if children are not academically strong? They're all academically strong, except when we say, okay, how about math? How about science? What's academic? What's not academic? In the future, who is going to be successful? What new skills, new ability will help people? We have no idea. It's the age of disruption. We need to really capitalize on the strength of every child. Every child comes to our school, literally, with something they are really good at. We just have to go accept that 
I think accepting that will be very important to say, you are good at something. If I were a, a preschool teacher or kindergarten teacher, I want to see every child in my class feeling good they can do something, but also acknowledging that they're not good at everything. They will need other people to help them. So I call that model a strength-based model. So your weakness is to allow others to help you. It's a very different, unique model of individual talent. And today you cannot be great without giving up certain things, you know. So that's actually a very different model. I mean, I hope you guys will read the book, you know, and so, but we're not really trying to here to market the book, but try to bring the ideas out there. And the, the collaboration with the Mike has been just great because Mike has done so much empirical research in special education, which has very broad implications for general education. Uh, let me, uh, I, and Jung is certainly right, weighing the pig doesn't make it fatter, right? So, I mean, the test itself don't necessarily, uh, <laughs> uh, make anything better. Um, um, wonderful question here by uh, uh, Crystal Linton. Crystal asked, uh, how do you help students be self-determined who feel beat up by education, whose strengths aren't academic, and they feel school isn't relevant? And Donald, you can join in too if you want to join us on that one. Well, I, I can respond. I, I'm sure you know everybody can jump into this one. Is that, uh, if you're an individual teacher, if you have a student like that, the whole system works against the child. I think it's your responsibility to save that child, to basically help that child, to forget about all this judgment that passes to say, you're good at something. We're gonna work on something you're good at. I can give you a job to do. I can think about this. So I, I think you're right now, I, I'm, I'm, I've seen a lot of schools in different countries. I have to tell you most schools do not give at all any space to help children grow. Go ahead. I was, Rick, I should jump in and say, how well do we know that child? Uh, how well does a team of educators and other uh, support providers work together in supporting that child and what he or she cares about? Um, how do we... Um, stick with that child over time so and ensure that he or she has a stable group of adults that know him or and her well and work with him or her over the years. Uh, these are the kinds of questions um, that we need to answer if we want to re-engage the disengaged learner who in many cases as young as and Michael have suggested have many reasons to be disengaged. Can I jump in here? Is that okay? Yeah. No, and, I, and I'm listening to all this, and I think it, it I, and I love in the conversation here, it goes back to, I feel, the notion of, of being culturally responsive, looking at those individuals and what those individuals bring to the classroom and thinking about it from that lens. I think we do have an educational system that is, again, focused on a perception, focused on a framework, and then and which it leaves a lot of people out. Um, I agree wholeheartedly that, you know, we spend more time on the curriculum than on learning. And how do we get teachers to understand just that, or even not just teachers, but the system to understand the importance of learning? Can we educate students that will be relevant five to 10 years from now? If we keep doing the same things we're doing, they won't be relevant, that we will lose another generation of students. And, and this might be more speaking to higher ed than any one of us, but that we really have to think about learning, have to think about those individual traits and, and, and talents that students do bring to the classroom and, and value those things and not look at those things as a deficit. Kids come into a classroom with experiences and we have to value those experiences they bring into the classroom and figure out how do we build on those experiences as they bring to the classroom. Now, I think one of my biases as well is that I started from SPED, so that kind of, that might be why a lot of, I agree with a lot of this, but it really is about how do you look at those individual children and what they bring and it goes back to the question you asked before, Rick, you think about how do you engage from a cultural lens is by that inquiry about knowing your children, by taking those assessments of your children and doing that work. There's some work out there right now on customized learning and individualized learning that some states are really looking at as ways to really kind of think about how learning can occur in a classroom that tears down the walls, that tears down this notion of what we think a curriculum should be, and it's based on, on students' learning. You know, I want to uh, thank you, Don. Uh, uh, Mike, I think this one will, should go to you to start with, and maybe the others can. This comes to us. Uh, 
number of people ask questions like this. This question comes to us from one of our uh, international observers here, uh, Gerald Fussell from, uh, uh, from British Columbia. And, and Gerald asks, how do we mitigate for those children who do not have the privilege of engaged and invested parents in supporting learning? Mike's cutting out. Uh, does somebody else want to jump in on that one? Um, where, where are, uh, where's parent university uh, in of, uh, of schools as hubs of communities? Um, where's our engagement uh, with parents uh, that goes beyond the PTA once, once a quarter um, dog and pony show. Um, that, that's, we, we, we've got to really work on that and to actually, and to do that well, we can't be running schools the way we've always run schools on the same timetable and the same schedule. Many of these parents are working two and three jobs and they can't come to school when educators want them to come to school. We've got to go to them. We've got to figure out how to do this and do it well. You know, I've never said this, Rick, I'm going to say this, this is going to be I don't know, controversial. A lot of times, parents are not able to control this. I think we, we have already have this authoritarian view of parents, teachers. We, we have a lot of control of our kids. We just believe they know more. You know, globally speaking, parents don't know more than the kids once kids get to a certain age. I can tell you when I was growing up, I'm talking about globally, we got 7 billion people. Think about how much. I grew up in a little village in China, a tiny village. After sec second grade, I already knew a lot more than everybody in my village. You know, so, so I was really kind of bringing the knowledge. I was the connector. I think we need to empower the kids. And the kids actually can do a lot more. A lot of parents in tough situations, they're not good models. They can't help. We have a lot of them. How do we help guide the kids? They are the ones who bring the knowledge back. Later on, I was working with a, on a project with a professor in, in Illinois. We were helping kids in Lahu, Northern Thailand. The kids were the innovators. They bring knowledge how to farm rice back home. They're changing this. This happened in Vietnam. So I'm just trying to bring that out to say, okay, let's not try to, you know, to say all these families have great parents. Sometimes parents control them. They are not necessarily good in a good position to do that. I 100% agree with that. And growing up in, in Houston and an impoverished community with a mother who worked a lot. And what really was valuable was more of the attention given to us while we were in the classroom, the intentionality of that in the classroom. Um, what we know in one of my first studies years ago, I won't say how many years ago, um, I found that schools only can account for about six to seven percent of the differences in children's scores in school. Six to seven percent. That means that 90 some odd percent of this is accounted for factors outside of the school. So as a system, we need to think about how do we account for more of the difference in learning than we do. We put a lot on parents and I agree that there are some parents that just they don't, I wouldn't say don't have the ability, they're, they're not capable because of so many other factors of contributing to that, that we have to really focus on how do we engage in those students and how do we build on their learning? I have a PhD and there are some things that my kids bring home with them from their inquisitive learning, I have no clue. And it's not that I can't do that, but what they're capable of doing and what they're able to do is very fascinating and it's independent of me. I think what we should talk to parents about is how do we give them that environment in which they can learn? How do we give them that safe place for learning? How do we give them that space in the house to study rather than trying to engage in how do we help them be a part of learning because it might be impossible to do. And I think that sometimes is the difference between the have and the have nots is that those who have can give the students opportunities to gather knowledge is something different. But we can do that in communities where they are, they're impoverished or they don't have that space and, and do those type of things. Not put so much dependence on the family to do this, but as, as teachers, how are we using that time in the classroom to be more 
um, intentional, more engaging. And hopefully what this is teaching us, this, this pandemic is teaching us, is that we can't keep doing the same things. We're having these kids and we're having them on this remote learning. We can't treat them as if they're in the classroom. We have to make this meaningful. We have to make this important because if not, they would just go through the motion and we will lose again, a generation of students. What questions uh, do you all have for one another? Well, actually, I was wondering about uh, Barry's uh, teacherpreneur work. I, I was uh, just wondering how are you supporting teachers, uh, teacherpreneurs to think about student autonomy, give more space, especially students when they have more say over their curriculum. That's what I'm very interested in because now, you know, the whole nation since No Child Left Behind has been chasing after state curriculum and national testing. So Barry, uh, uh, Bernard, what, what, are you, what are you thinking about? Well, I mean, I'm not directly involved in that work uh, as I was for about eight or nine years um, in the last, um, um, but I will say that we clearly, that was the intention. Uh, and in some places where we were able to um, resource these, uh, these hybrid positions, uh, it indeed began to happen but it was very difficult to sustain it inside of a system that was designed um, for a bygone era. Um, we have had some residual um, positive impact, Young, uh, in a couple of districts where we did this, but for the most part, uh, it's more the same. Uh, however, at the same time, we have seen an explosion of teachers who are innovating uh, and making major differences in the lives of children, but we don't have a system to capitalize on their innovation. And that's what uh, keeps me up at night amongst other things right now. Uh, great question that uh, somebody raised on the, on the question. Um, we've been talking a lot about self-determination. I wonder in your classes, uh, doctoral classes and the like, um, is, are the students self-determining in your, in your classes? Or are you teaching more traditionally? And, and, and in addition to that, um, uh, if we create this cadre of uh, self-determined uh, uh, educators and students, and we have administrators who are not sensitive to this, how do we get administrators sensitive to this as well? And it requires a lot of systematic change to get away from the testing, Jung, that you've certainly written about and critiqued so uh, well over the years. Mike, I don't know if you're able to join in on this one or, or others. I, I think I'm back. My apologies to everyone for the Wi-Fi issues. It's, it's been pretty good most of the last six months, but <laughs> it was this uh, a really bad time to uh, mess with me. But, uh, you know, I try to incorporate uh, a lot of these things into uh, uh, the way I teach at the university level. I'm sure that uh, the students that I'm with with the uh, might quibble with some of it. Of course, we're beholden to standards for teacher, teacher licensure. We've, you know, we've got to work this into these systems. But, uh, you know, I think, uh, and I think that uh, higher ed uh, uh, can, uh, should do some soul searching. And, uh, you know, I think that, uh, uh, I think that our provost is talking about moving uh, university to embrace these things. Certainly these issues of self-determined learning come out of in, in one element of uh, adult online learning where, uh, you know, adults learn because they want to learn something and they want to learn it in the way they want to learn it. They're, you know, uh, and so, uh, uh, so there's lots of opportunities, I think, for higher ed to, uh, to also look at the ways that we do things. I'm, I might uh, give a little commercial for the School of Education on our online programs and our master's degrees. We're going to be releasing a master's degree program where you can choose, uh, students can choose the courses that they want and they need to make up their master's degree. And it won't be prescribed by us as to what it is that you need to study, to get a master's degree in whatever the areas are. Young, Rick, like you I, wanted to jump in. May I jump in just uh, very quickly, uh, just to say that I try to do that in all my courses I teach uh, in all these years. But I really would like to add, um, by the time students get into PhD courses, which most of them I teach, they've lost it. It's very hard for many of the students to really pick on that. I mean, that, that's just to be very honest. And, and uh, 
I know Jared is you know, you know, uh, over there, but that's very good. Even students, I think, in the Vancouver group is much better, but not all of them. Seriously, I think a lot of students, they've lost ability to be self-determined. So, so that's why we want this to be Ernie, to be on. But by the way, so self-determination does not mean we actually, everyone knows your own thing. Remember, you have a culture, you have a school, you have a whole community. There's a lot of renegotiation and uh, happening over there. You're building a better community I I in that way. That is, uh, so, so that's uh, actually, it's kind of different. But again, this is a very long story. To, so I try very hard in my teaching, in my advising of PhD students to do this, but I can tell you it's very hard by the time we get to the PhD level. And, and you run up against all of us linear thinkers and doers, and, and that's, uh, and that's how we've been trained. Arnett, you wanted to jump yes, in. Yes, uh, just on the, on the angle of the teacher-administrator divide that uh, undermines this type of future-oriented work we're trying to make happen. To what extent do our universities um, uh, prepare future teachers and future administrators together in some fashion? Or do we silo that preparation, socialization? Well, folks, we're coming up uh, towards the end of our time. We've got about another minute or two. I do want to remind, I want to thank our presenters. I thought uh, we had a wonderful conversation, uh, lots of engagement. We've got uh, about 60 questions here. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to all of them, but we tried to touch uh, uh, on many of the points that were raised. Um, you will be given a, uh, a sent a survey, and we ask that you fill that survey out and respond to us. Uh, we'll be launching our global academy. We're going to invite all of you to join and become a part of that, where we'll be having uh, uh, presentations by uh, wonderful people, uh, uh, much like you heard from today in the past days. Uh, uh, my colleague, Lisa Wolf Wendell, was going to uh, be facilitating this and would have done a far better job than I did, but she had uh, some uh, uh, personal uh, family issues that came up and wasn't able to join us, so our, our best to, to Lisa. Uh, any final remarks? We've got about a minute left uh, to end us on a high note. I, one of you for done a fabulous gentlemen. job, Rick. Are you, as a dean, you are great. Our Global Honor Academy will be great. I hope actually everybody participating here will be able to check in with us. I think uh, uh, this is very important work for us, the self-determination work, which I think is the foundation for a lot of future work. Everything, yeah, everything that needs to be done that we've talked about is already being done somewhere. We just don't have the system yet all the pieces in any one jurisdiction, but it's all been done. The future is already here, not evenly distributed. Donald, final thoughts? I think, you know, I've mentioned this a number of times about the intentionality, that the work we do, it has to be intentional. It has to be meaningful. It has to be for a purpose rather than, you know, keep jumping through the hoops. Um, those who are intentional and those who make this work intentional are much more effective in reaching children than those who are not. And I think that's something that's obvious. And Mike, are the last word? Uh, well, in the first uh, of the of the three uh, uh, summer sessions, uh, the the superintendent of Lawrence Schools, uh, Dr. Anthony Lewis, said uh, that their goal was to make students be the CEOs of their own learning. And uh, so, you know, and I think that we as who, who, who are in education have a unique moment here and we must not, let, we must not waste it. We've got so many things to change, both what was discussed in the first panel and in the second. So uh, we just, we need to, we need to embrace this moment and really uh, uh, be able to move into the future. So. Thank you all for joining. Thanks to our uh, presenters. Thank you all for joining us. We've got uh, over 200 CEOs out there listening. We look forward to working with you more in the future. Thank you again.